Morning, everyone. Uh, let's open our Bibles to Psalm 118. And we've got a, a uh, what would you call it, a, a joyful collision of the adult Sunday school class A and B this morning. Uh, we, the, the young adults class is with you this morning, and we've joked that it's really uh, a misnomer. It's, it's more of the young, young and hearts adult class, so um, it, it's really a joy to be together this morning. So uh, by way of introduction, on the night that Jesus was to be betrayed by Judas, handed over to the Romans and abandoned by his disciples, he shared dinner with his disciples. And we refer to this meal as the Last Supper, of course, and it was a Passover meal celebrated annually in Israel in conjunction with the seven-day-long Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the, the Passover meal memorialized Israel's exodus from Egypt. And on that night, the Lord shared the Passover dinner with his disciples, and that is where he instituted the Lord's Supper after explaining the significance of the bread and the wine as signs of his broken body and shed blood for the forgiveness of sins, he went out to the Mount of Olives oh, with the 12 minus Judas. But before exiting the house, they sang a hymn. And there's good reason to think that the hymn they sang the last hymn they sang before the Lord's uh, Passion was Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is the last of the psalms in a group referred to as the Egyptian Hallel Psalms, Egyptian Praise Psalms. And they have that name because as Psalm 114 verse 1 says, Israel went out from Egypt. Accordingly, Psalms 113 through 118, this group of praise psalms, helped the people of Israel look back and remember their past redemption from slavery in Egypt. By recalling the, uh, the past exodus from Egypt, they looked backward. But in the Passover meal when they were singing these psalms, it, it wasn't merely to remember and to look backward. It was to look forward with anticipation. By recalling the past exodus of the Lord from, from Egypt, the Jews sang this song in anticipation of a future exodus, a new exodus, led by a future ideal Davidic king in which God's people would be redeemed from slavery. Now, with that in mind, it makes good sense uh, why these psalms would be uh, functioning in the Passover meal. At the meal, Psalms 113 and 114 would be sung before dinner, and Psalms uh, 115 and 118, or through 118, would be sung after dinner. So as we read in Matthew 26, verse 30, after they shared the bread and wine, when they had sung us a, a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives after dinner. The point is that since the last supper was a Passover meal, and since these psalms were sung at the Passover meal, uh, it, it's probable that Psalm 118 was, was the last song on the Lord's lips as he was going to the cross. If you allow that thought to capture your imagination, it, uh, it brings a deepness of sobriety and, I think, wonder when you open your Bible to Psalm 118, when you read it. And this wonder is enhanced further when you study the use of this psalm in the New Testament. And that's where we're going to be headed together this morning. So just briefly, and this is still introductory, I want to open up Psalm 118 verse 22 with you, and then we'll go from there. So um, this is kind of part two to a lesson that... Uh, was uh, in the young adults class about a year ago. And so there's a fuller treatment of the psalm there. But I just want to look at this one verse in context before we go to the New Testament. 
So after recalling, uh, sorry, after calling the congregation of Israel to give thanks in verses one through four of this psalm, uh, and after recounting a spectacular deliverance of the Lord on the field of battle in verses five through 18, in verses 19 through 29 of this psalm, uh, the king leads the congregation of Israel in a ceremony of thanksgiving at the temple. And as the king is in the context of the temple with the congregation around him, he's leading them in worship. And he says this in Psalm 118, verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. In other words, the king who was rejected by opposing nations on the field of battle so that he was almost defeated. He has been restored to the place of prominence in his kingdom because the Lord delivered him on the field of battle. The stone is the king who was rejected by the nations, the builders, uh, but who has become the cornerstone, the chief foundation stone uh, of the temple, figuratively speaking, because the king was responsible in the nation of Israel for the promotion and the upholding of true religion and worship of the Lord in Israel. It's a figurative uh, representation of the king's role as the leader of the nation. Though he was rejected by men, he was accepted by God and vindicated Passing through a period of humiliation, he was exalted. Having gone through suffering, he was, in this sense, glorified. In this sense. With this clearly in our minds, uh, we should not at all be surprised as we come to the New Testament and find that our Lord taught this verse not only as a temporal deliverance of a past king. Jesus taught that this verse foreshadowed the ultimate rejection and vindication. His own death and resurrection. In Luke chapter 20, Jesus was teaching and preaching in the temple. And after telling the parable of the wicked tenants in which he compared the Jewish leaders to evil workers in God's vineyard who murdered his servants, the Old Testament prophets, and climactically murdered God's son himself. After that parable, he quoted our verse, Psalm 118, verse 22. He said in Mark's gospel, have you not read this scripture to the experts in the law? An ironic and piercing statement. By quoting Psalm 118, 22, Jesus revealed that the king who was rejected by men but vindicated by God typified himself. In other words, uh, the king in the events of his life in Psalm 118 foreshadowed um, an even greater rejection and deliverance to come. Indirectly then, Psalm 118 is messianic prophecy. Uh, in his death and resurrection, Jesus was rejected by men and exalted by God to be the cornerstone of the true temple of God, the one not made by hands. This scene at the temple in Luke chapter 20 happened before the Last Supper. Think about that. Assuming that we are correct in our conclusion that Psalm 118 was the last of the hymns that the Lord sang on the night when he was delivered over and arrested and ultimately crucified. Assuming that we're correct, what must it have been like to sing this psalm with his disciples at the Last Supper? Knowing that it referred to his impending crucifixion, his death and resurrection. The eternal word of God who from the Father and in the Holy Spirit inspired these words centuries before in his assumed human nature 
uttered these words with his disciples as he was entering the shadow of his cross. That's amazing and sobering. The word of God made flesh uttered these words with his human voice on that night. In and of itself, that's, that's enough to absolutely floor me. I don't know about you. But I also think about the, the, the 11 with him as they sang. I wonder how much they perceived at this point. I assume they were with Jesus in the temple when he taught that this referred to him. I wonder how much they perceived as they were singing it with the Lord at the Last Supper. Did they perceive the gravity and the finality of the words as they sang them? Been thinking about that question off and on for the last year. And it's kind of the, the question that um, this lesson arose out of. What influence did Psalm 118 verse 22 exert on the apostles? And specifically... I'm concerned with the Apostle Peter. Uh, what significance did this have for him as he read his Bible, so to speak, throughout his life and ministry? There's only one way to answer that, and that's to look at his use of this verse in the New Testament. It's a, an indicator of the significance that it had uh, for him in his life and in his ministry. So that's the main question. What significance does Peter's use of Psalm 118, verse 22, what did it have for him, and, and what does it have for you and for me? That question has a two-part answer, and it forms the two main headings of this lesson. First, first of all, uh, Peter's use of Psalm 118, 22 reveals who God is and what he's done for us in Christ. And secondly, it defines who we are and what our duty is to God. To use the helpful theological terms that Professor Murray, that Dr. Hamilton referred to last week in his book, Redemption, Accomplished and Applied, to use those terms. Peter's use of Psalm 118.22 reveals both the accomplishment and the application of our redemption by the triune God. So with the time we have left, we will look at Peter's use of Psalm 118, 22 in Acts chapter 4 and in 1 Peter 2. In Acts 4, Peter emphasizes the accomplishment of redemption. And in 1 Peter 2, he emphasizes its application. So first of all, Peter's use of Psalm 118 in Acts 4, 11 reveals who God is and what he has done for us in Christ. So in Acts 4, Peter and John have been arrested and are being interrogated for their miraculous deeds, the healing of the lame man, and for their bold preaching of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the Jerusalem temple. Luke quoted, if you look at Acts 4-7, the main question in this uh, trial, really, uh, that the Jewish authorities are asking Peter and John. By what power or by what name did you do this? Referring to the healing of the lame man at the beautiful gate. This question paints the scene in a, a remarkably similar hue to the scene in Luke chapter 20, where the Lord is being interrogated uh, by the Sanhedrin, and the same question is at hand. By whose authority are you doing these things? In both places, the question came from the Jews, and in both places, the main, main concern was authority. Peter's response comes in three parts, in verses 8 through 12, and that's our main concern. So first of all, Peter gives a straightforward answer to this question, verses 8 through 10. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you 
and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. So by what authority do they do these things? By the name, by the authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. By him this man is standing before you well, Peter said. And that's Peter's unambiguous answer, straightforward. But he took it further in verse 10. He pointed the finger at his interrogators, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. And he continues that description of Christ in verse 11. And that's the second part of his answer. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Peter makes explicit the conclusions that the Lord implied in Luke 20. The builders were the Jews. The rejected stone who became the cornerstone of the true temple is Jesus Christ. Taking verse 10 and 11 together then, we see that in his death, Jesus was rejected by men and in his resurrection, he was vindicated by God. As Peter put it in Acts chapter 2, uh, 23 and 24, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. This death and resurrection accomplished the redemption of God's people. That's where Peter goes next in verse 12, in the final part of his answer. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is salvation from the wrath of God on the day of judgment in no place else. Salvation from the wrath of God on the day of judgment is found in one place, in one person, Jesus Christ. If you're standing this morning on any other foundation, your hope will be turned to shame in the day of God's wrath. Stand on Christ, the cornerstone. He cannot fail. Call on his name and trust the promise of uh, Peter, the Lord through Peter in Acts 2.21. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It's a promise, and it's a true one. So what significance uh, did Psalm 118 have for the Apostle Peter? The first answer is that it revealed who God is and what he has done for us in Christ, emphasizing the accomplishment of our redemption by the triune God. Jesus died for sinners, and to use the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 6, 4, he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Before, before moving on to our second answer to that question, uh, there's another dynamic in this scene that has, I think, practical significance for you. Uh, not many days before these courageous words of Peter in Acts chapter 4, Peter abandoned the Lord in utter cowardice. In John 18 17, when the Lord had been arrested and was under investigation by the Jews, Peter wouldn't even associate with the Lord in the face of a servant girl. He was unwilling to identify with him in that moment. How did such a coward grow to be so courageous as we see him in Acts chapter 4? The short answer is by God's grace through the ministry of his word and spirit. 
the risen Lord Jesus forgave and restored Peter. He spent 40 days with him, him and the others, teaching Peter that everything written about him in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms had to be fulfilled in him. And then he opened his mind to understand the scriptures. Luke 24. Afterwards, the risen Lord ascended into heaven and poured out his spirit upon him. Thus, Peter was restored by grace, instructed in the word, and empowered by the spirit of God. When we see him in Acts chapter 4. His boldness and courage did not come from within himself. Peter was not a great man in and of himself. And in fact, neither am I, and neither are you a great man or woman in and of yourself. He was a forgiven and a restored man. His boldness was a gift of God's enabling grace, a fruit of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter's transformation from a coward to a man of courage came by the sanctifying grace of the Lord's ministry through his word, Psalm 118, 22, and his spirit. The same is true for you in Christ today. The ordinary means of grace are the ministry of the word and the sacrament, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And uh, I say the ministry of the word primarily referring to the preached word in the gathered church, but of course, certainly, also your private study and internalization of the truth of God in his word. These are what we call the ordinary means of grace. James Bannerman described these ordinary means of grace as the channel through which the deep and mysterious tide of supernatural power flows to the members of the church from God. The channel through which the deep and mysterious tide of divine and supernatural power flows to the members of the church from God. This study of the influence of Psalm 118, 22 on Peter, as the risen Lord opened his mind to perceive its significance by the Holy Spirit, this is an example of what the Lord will do in the lives of other ordinary sinners like you and I. You're here gathered with the church this morning uh, to partake of these ordinary means of grace, the ministry of the word and the sacrament. So let me encourage you. If you feel this morning, especially, the acute struggle with sin and the hostile forces of this age, as God accompanies the ministry of his word and sacrament with his Holy Spirit, he is making you what you ought to be by his grace. Though Peter lived in a unique chapter of redemptive history and his extraordinary experiences are not something that you ought to seek to replicate, even though that's true, this much is also true. As Peter was sanctified by the ministry of the word and spirit, so are you. In the words of the Apostle Paul, we all, with unveiled face, by beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So first, the, the point is that Peter's use of... Uh, of uh, Psalm 118.22 and Acts 4.11 reveals who God is and what he has done for us in Christ. Secondly, his use of it in 1 Peter 2 defines who we are and what our duty is to God. So turn with me to 1 first, first Peter chapter 2. Peter wrote this letter probably a couple decades after the scene that we saw in Acts chapter 4. And he addressed it to Christians throughout the region of Asia Minor in order to encourage them in their present suffering and to prepare them for this future fiery trial which was coming. 
and his encouragement for the believers is summed up well and at the very end, in chapter 5, verse 10. He said, uh, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. After a little while. So in chapter 1, Peter goes back and forth. Uh, between proclamations of God's grace and His regenerating work in the believers to exhortations to a life of holiness. Uh, After another statement of God's work of the new birth in the believers at the end of chapter 1, which God did by His imperishable word, at the beginning of chapter 2, Peter exhorted them to long for that word, the good news that was preached to you, to long for that word as a newborn infant longs for spiritual milk. His aim for them was that they would grow up into salvation. That's verses 1 through 3 of the second chapter. And then in verses 4 through 10, he mixes metaphors. Uh, He painted that growing up of the newborn infant into salvation as the edification of a building. And the main statement out of which everything else grows in verses 4 through 10 of chapter 2 is in verse 5, at the beginning of verse 5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. It's kind of the main claim here. And so before that, in verse 4, the time when the church is being built up as a spiritual house is as you come to him, As you come to Christ, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Notice that those who come to Christ in faith bear his image. As you come to the living stone, you yourself are like a living stone. And you are incorporated into the spiritual house, the true temple of God. As you come to Jesus in faith, the master builder mortars you to him in an unbreakable union by his Holy Spirit. You're like a living stone, united to the living stone. The result is a temple dwelling for the Lord, a spiritual house. Now the purpose of the church's upbuilding as a spiritual house is in order that they become a holy priesthood. And the purpose of the identity and the role as a holy priesthood is to offer up spiritual sacrifices well-pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. That's the rest of verse 5. You yourselves are like living stones. I'm sorry. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then in verse 6, notice the the four at the beginning of the verse. That indicates that verse 6 is an explanation of verse 5, of what he said in verse 5. So the background or the explanation for the church's edification as a spiritual house is found in Old Testament prophecy. For it stands in Scripture, Peter wrote, verse 6, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So from another Old Testament passage, which this could be a whole part three to this discussion, Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. From that passage, Peter identifies Christ as the cornerstone. And don't miss the promise at the end of verse six. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. In other words, if you come to Christ the cornerstone and stand on him by faith, you will never be shaken. Not ultimately. From that Old Testament promise in verse 6, Peter draws out the consequence. Verse 7, so, therefore, the honor, 
if you have the New American Standard. This precious value is for you who believe. It's for you who believe. In other words, the honor of being built as a living stone onto Christ, the honored cornerstone, that honor belongs to you who believe. Christ's honor becomes the honor of all those who identify with him by faith, by virtue of union with him. And the contrast, of course, to this honor that those who believe receives receive uh, is the shame that unbelievers experience by stumbling over the stone. It's the rest of verse 7 and 8. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. And of course, that last phrase, there's a world of wonder wrapped up in that, as they were destined to do. It speaks of the sovereignty, the absolute sovereignty of God and man's salvation, of course. Notice Peter's quotation of Psalm 118.22 in verse 7. To refuse to believe in Jesus Christ as the one who died and was raised for sinners. To refuse to believe that is to be identified with the builders who rejected him. It is to stumble over him. To stumble over this stone is to fall eternally. And notice in verse 8 that the reason for their stumbling and unbelief is disobedience. They stumble, Peter wrote, because they disobey the word. If you are in unbelief this morning, um, please do not mask your qualms with God, with the living God, as merely intellectual issues about the problem of evil or uh, why bad things happen to good people or any number of, of important and necessary questions to consider, no doubt. I would never dissuade you from asking those questions, but please don't mask them as your main issue with God. Your problem is that you have transgressed God's law and you are a rebel. Your problem is disobedience. And your only solution is faith and repentance. This is a warning to all who disobey the word of God by refusing to submit to Jesus as Lord and to trust in him as Savior. Repent, please. Come to him. All of these precious promises to those who believe will be yours. It's true. Well, Peter concludes with a beautiful collage of monikers for the church in verses 9 through 10. If you have come to Christ by faith, this is who you are. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now let me bring together several truths uh, from this passage to expound our, our second main point, which is that Peter's use of our verse from the Psalms here defines who we are and what our duty is to God. First of all, personal faith in Christ identifies individuals with him. The living stone. So it identifies you with Christ, the living stone, and it incorporates you into the church. Faith. As you come to him, Peter said in verse 4, you are being built up. 
Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This honor is for you who believe. It's faith. Conversely, of course, unbelief identifies individuals with the builders, those who stumble over Christ the cornerstone and fall eternally. To believe in Christ is to come to him as the stone who was rejected by men but vindicated by God. To come to him is to know and trust Jesus for who he is, the God-man who died for sinners and was raised for sinners. So who are we? Who are we? The identity of the church is both the true temple of God and the royal priesthood. The church is the true temple of God, a spiritual house composed of living stones. The church is also a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. It's who we are. Peter's use of Psalm 118, 22 defines who we are and also defines what our duty is to God. So what is it? The purpose of the church as a holy priesthood is to offer up spiritual sacrifices well-pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. And one of those well-pleasing sacrifices is that we proclaim his excellencies. The excellencies of the one who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. As the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 42, 12 through 13, let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise, his excellencies in the coastlands. The Lord goes out like a mighty man, like a man of war. He stirs up his zeal. He cries out, he shouts aloud, he shows himself mighty against his foes. That is the Lord. God reveals his excellencies and his works as they are revealed in the books of his world and in his word. They're revealed nowhere more clearly than at the cross. Study them. Study his excellencies. Enjoy them and proclaim them. So what significance did this verse from our psalm have for the Apostle Peter, and what significance does it have for us today? It reveals who God is and what he has done for us in Christ, emphasizing the accomplishment of our redemption. In his dying for sinners, he was rejected by men, and in his rising for sinners, he was vindicated by God. It also reveals who we are and what our duty is to God. We're a spiritual house, a royal priesthood. Because of this union, we're closing with this. Because of this union with Jesus Christ, in which we as living stones are built on the cornerstone, because of that, our destiny is bound up with him. Because of union with Christ, because you are tethered to him, your destiny is bound up with him both in his rejection by men and in his vindication by God. If you're united to Christ, the rejected stone, expect to be rejected by men. Jesus taught that a servant is not greater than his master. If the world hates you, and it does, know that it hated me first, the Lord said. Embrace this union with Christ in the rejection of men. Embrace it. The Apostle Paul did. He wrote in Philippians 3, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that. Why did he do that? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. There is a knowledge of Christ's glory that comes through communion with him and his suffering. And especially so because of suffering on account of being associated with him 
Your destiny is bound up with Christ and his rejection by men. But also in his vindication by God. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into his death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly, certainly, be united with him in a resurrection like his. Statements like these are why the Apostle Paul could write, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. For this light momentary affliction, he wrote, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The dwelling of God is with man now and in the consummation. What more do you want? What more do you want? Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of your Son, the rejected and vindicated living stone of the true temple, Jesus Christ. And by the power of your Spirit who has united us to him and to one another this morning, we thank you, God. As we go into the next hour, Lord, I pray that you would help these uh, dear uh, brothers and sisters internalize this truth of your word that we are a spiritual house and we experience that um, no day of the week more profoundly and acutely than on Sunday morning. So help us, Lord, as we go to sing and to pray together and to interact with your word as it is preached. Help us, Lord, to worship in spirit and truth and to honor you. May you be glorified. May our gratitude and our contentment and um, all of our graces increase as a result of your uh, gracious work in us. Uh, we need you, Lord. We need you. In Christ's name, amen.